Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for your wonderful love for us and that you call us to mutually submit. Help us to understand what that even means. Uh, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and direct us so that we can become more and more the people that you've called us to be and understand that incredible love that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, when I say submission, how many of you like go, wow, that's really cool. I, I want to hear more about submission. Anybody? Yeah, not, not a whole lot of us. We're Americans, and we kind of like our, our freedom and the like. But let, before we talk about submission, let's talk about this. Elite versus super elite athletes. We just had the Olympics, right? And there are some of those athletes that are elite. They win Olympic medals. They're just incredible athletes, and you look up to them, and they've worked very, very hard to get there. But some of them are super elite. You know, they're the, the Michael Phelps. And I think we have to turn this down just a tiny bit because I'm a little bit, yeah. Um, they're the Michael Phelps and those kinds of athletes that are just beyond. You know, they win lots and lots of gold medals and, and they're just super elite. Well, they did some study to find out what's the difference between the elite athletes and the super elite athletes. Anybody know what, it, what it, one of the main things is? One of the main things is that with super elite athletes, they really believe and feel that their coaches care about them as a person. They care about every part of their life. They care about their, uh, you know, their emotional well-being. They care about how they're doing in a day-to-day. -day. That's kind of an interesting thing. You know, you wouldn't think about that. But with super elite athletes, yes, they have those physical capabilities, but they also have somebody that's in their corner that listens to them and, and, and cares about who they are as a person. Well, let's think about that in terms of submission. When you're an athlete, you have to submit to your coach, right? Well, how well do you submit to someone that you're not sure really has your back? How well are you able to follow somebody's advice? See, a lot of those elite athletes have coaches that are very good technically, and they tell them what they're supposed to do, but they just don't have that sense that that coach is really, really, really there for them. And if you're going to become super elite, you need to have somebody that's really, really there in your, in your corner for you. And so as we look at this, I think it really kind of... Um, helps us understand a little bit about the bi biblical idea of submission. And we'll get there. But see, the thing is, is that submission is not something we like to talk about. We don't like being told what to do. Uh, read this comic here. You, you can see up here. Um, goodness, you're filthy. Into the tub with you. I obey the letter of the law, if not the spirit. Let's hear some water running. Nuts. He was, he was in the tub. He was in the tub, but he hadn't turned on the water. He'd actually done what he was supposed to do. But that's like all of us, right? We'd like to decide what we're going to do for ourselves, and we don't like anybody telling us what to do. Get yourself vaccinated. No, I'm not going to do it. Get yourself a mask on. No, I'm not going to do it. Do this. You know, no, I decide what I'm going to do. I am a free American, and I can decide what I want to do, right? 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 I mean, that's the, that's the way we feel anyway. But the fact is, the Bible says this, and read with me. Submit to one another in the fear of Christ. Submit to one another in the fear. That means in the respect. Because we respect Jesus, we're going to submit to one another. And it sounds kind of hard, but in another way, we submit all the time. How many of you went to school at some point or another? Yeah. Well, in, your, in school, you do have to submit to the teacher, right? You have to do what the teacher asks you to do. If you've gone to a, a play, very often, even if you're going into one of these big auditoriums, you have to submit to the usher. It's kind of a weird thing, but the usher tells you where to walk, right? If you go to a fire, you have to submit to the fireman, right? That you, you have to submit to... Absolutely. to absolutely. <laughs> he thinks at home you've got to do that too, right? <laughs> no, and you go to the grocery store. And the grocery store, you're sitting there, you walk through the line. You can't just say, no, I am not putting my stuff up on that thing there. I, I'm just going to do, I'm going to do it my way, right? You have to submit to the rules of the situation and put your stuff up on the little uh, uh, conveyor belt. And you have to listen to what she says. And, and I mean, that's, that's part of how our, our society works. So we're called as Christians, not just to submit in those kinds of ways, but to submit to each other. And what in the world does that mean? There's a story, and I think this kind of helps us a little bit. 
uh, in the 1976 Olympics. And it's, it's, this story's been exaggerated, but it's, it's based on a true story, and I'm going to try to get back to the more true story of it. There was a Special Olympics in Spokane, Washington. And as there were nine runners that started out in the race, and Special Olympics, those guys train hard, and they want to be successful, right? They, they want to win. Just like the regular Olympics, they want to win. So they were getting ready for this, this race, and they took off. And immediately after one came out of the blocks, one uh, young man fell flat on his face. Now two of the other athletes saw him fall and stopped and looked back. And then they went back to him. They picked him up, and they gathered arm in arm. Now in the stories, everybody says, well, they all walked with him. They kissed his knee, all sorts of stuff. Well, that's all, all added on to it. But these two athletes, they went back, and they joined arms, and they ran the rest of the race together. Now, they came in much later than the others, but the whole stadium was applauding for them. Why? Why? Because they had done the right thing. They submitted to the needs of their brother. You know, they saw that he had a need, and they submitted to him. And that's what submission is. Submission is this. Mutual submission means that we set aside our selfish desires and work together for the goals of Christ's kingdom. Let's read that again. Mutual submission means that we set aside our selfish desires and work together for the goals of the kingdom, for Christ's kingdom. Yeah. So what happens is, is that, that instead of just looking to what we need, submission says, okay, I'm going to look to what others need. And this section of scripture starts out by saying we mutually submit to each other. It doesn't matter if you're the man or the woman. And then... He's going to go and explain what that looks like in the context of a Christian marriage. And it starts out this way. Read with me. Wives, submit to your husbands. Hey, some of you didn't read that. No, it's all right. <laughs> Wives, submit to your husbands. Now, I got to tell you that this was nothing revolutionary. In the ancient world, wives were considered legally property. They were owned by their husbands. So when you said, wives, submit to your husbands, it wasn't like people went, really? In fact, it, it, it'd be kind of like today if you went into the prison and said, prisoners, you should listen to what the guards have to say. Oh, they say, duh. I mean, everybody knows that. I mean, it, it, they, we don't always do it, but you should, right? And so at this time in the ancient world, the idea of, of wives submitting to their husbands Everybody knew that. Paul wasn't saying anything that was revolutionary. He was just saying what everybody knew. But now he's going to twist it a little bit. He's going to change the, the way that this, this works. See, read with me. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. You expect Paul to say, wives, submit to your husbands because he owns you, and if you don't do it, you're going to get punished, right? What does he say? No, wives, submit to your husbands. Why? Because just like there's this relationship, this close relationship, like Christ's relationship with the church. Now, think about it. How well does your head work without your body? You know, if you just take off your head and try to, try to operate, it doesn't work. How does your body work without the head? They have to be together. And so he's saying there's this intimate relationship. He's changing the foundation for the reason that a woman wants to set aside her rights for her husband. Why? Because the two of them are joining as one, and they're working together as a family. They're working together. And that's the kind of submission that the Bible is talking about. So all of a sudden, the woman's not just a piece of property, but the woman is part of her husband. They are connected and joined together as, as one unit. Let's read on. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Now here's the revolutionary thing, because this word love here, this isn't eros, which would be the Greek word for, for romantic love, you know, like, like uh, you know, give, give your wife a hug. This is not, you know, like friendly love, like let's be friends with each other. This is agape. And if you heard that term before, that's a self-sacrificial love. That's the, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's, I'm going to lay down my life for you. And so Paul is now saying, you know what? We've just talked about women submitting. Now, men, you're going to do the same thing. We're going to use little, little different terms. You're going to lay down your life 
for your wife, just like Jesus laid down his life. Pretty tall order. He's saying, look, you got to lay down your rights. Why? Because you, well, you want to love that woman that God has given you. Jesus went all the way to the cross because of his love for the church. And so as a husband, I want you to do the same kind of thing. Lay down your life because in this unit together, you're working together for a higher goal. Read with me. To make her holy, cleansing her with the washing by the, of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. See, in the ancient world, they had these mikvahs. They're, they're like bathtubs that you would go down to and do purification for lots of different reasons. Um, that's where our Christian thing of uh, baptism comes from. You know, as we start our Christian walk with God, we go down into the water, and it, it connects us with Jesus who died for us, and we are cleansed. Now, Paul is not saying, husbands, you better go and give your wives a bath. That's not what he's talking about. What he's saying is, look, just like Jesus, he did everything so that, our, that that woman could be the best that she possibly could. He laid down his life so that his wife, his wife, the bride, the bride of Christ, the church, could be the best it could possibly be. So you husbands, you should do the same thing. Do everything for the good, for the best of your wife. Submission is putting your own life aside so that you can do the best for another person. The idea in a Christian marriage is that both husband and wife are looking so that, that they're both trying to make sure that the other one can thrive, that we thrive together. And that's not just in a Christian marriage, that's in a Christian church. Because I know some of you, you know, you're, you're not married at the present time. But even so, in the church, we're looking, how can, we, how can we help each other be the best we can possibly be? How can we set aside our own rights so that we can, can thrive as we seek the kingdom of God? And that's what God wants for us, because it's a much better way to live. Now, it doesn't work if some are, like, taking advantage of that, right? The idea is that all of us are setting aside our rights for the good of the whole. Read with me. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church since we are members of his body. He says, look, you're so connected. You're not like two, right? You're one. You're connected, and you, you have that kind of a, a, a loving bond. Unfortunately, in our world, it doesn't always happen that way, but that's God's design, because it's supposed to be like Christ in his church, and Christ in his church is connected that closely together. Now, there's another sidebar. I've got to take a little bunny trail here, because did you know that in Washington, one out of every five women is physically abused by her husband. It's huge. That's huge. And if it's one out of every five women, I don't know what the statistics are in a church, but that even in a church, there are people where there's this violence going on in the home, domestic violence. And we as a church need to stand up and say, that can't happen, right? One out of every seven men has, has experienced violence in a relationship like that too. The fact is, we should stand up as a church and say it's wrong. Why? Because if you look at it, you know what? If we're members of the body, if we're, if we're both one, then it's, if, if somebody is violent in a marriage, that means they're a little bit crazy. I like this picture. How about this? What do you say about this guy? Would you say the guy needs some help? Right? Right? So if somebody is hitting their spouse, they also need help. Now, that doesn't mean we should be judgmental and start being judgmental on people. What it means is we should try to find ways to help. Because if that many people are being hurt in relationships, we need to find ways to strengthen relationships so it doesn't happen, right? Because God designed that we're supposed to be loving each other and working together and submitting to one another. Okay, enough of my little bunny trail there. Let's read. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. He's quoting Genesis. He says, look, you're supposed to come together as one flesh. This is a Maori uh, from New Zealand, a Maori um, carving. And the, the idea behind it is that there's, it's a relationship where there's twisted, where your lives are intertwined. They're intertwined. And notice there's no beginning or end because the idea is that the relationship's not supposed to end. 
And that's the relationship that Christ has with us. We're intertwined. Our lives are intertwined with Christ's life. And he talks about this also um, for Christian marriage. The whole idea behind Christian marriage is we're supposed to be connected in that kind of a way. What a beautiful image. The basis of Christian marriage is a spiritual unity that reflects Christ's relationship with his church. That reflects Christ's relationship with his church. Read with me. This mystery is profound, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. So he says, look, I've been talking about marriage, but it's bigger than marriage. This is Jesus and Jesus' love for his church. And Jesus loves us so much that he wants to use that picture of a husband and a wife to show how much he loves us and how connected he is to us. Jesus came into this world and died for us. And he wants us to be in that relationship with him forever. He's done everything he can to forgive you of your sins so that you can be in that relationship with him. And he wants to have that relationship with you, not just now, but lasting into eternity. Christ desires that we have an intimate, eternal relationship with him, characterized by love and submission. But what is submission? Do you remember? It's setting aside our rights so that we can work together for the, co- for the good of the kingdom. Right? It's not submitting just uh, you know, this kind of, you do what I say type of thing. It's just saying, okay, we're going to set aside our rights because we have something higher that we're working for. And we're working for the kingdom, which is to make sure every person knows that love of God, the truth that Jesus loves them, and that he wants them to be in an intimate relationship with them forever. Amen. Any questions or comments or thoughts? None? (laughs) Okay. What is what? Wheaties. Wheaties? Well, the breakfast, yeah, actually, they, they have not found that super elite cha- champions eat more Wheaties than others. They have not found that. So, good, good, good comment, Tom. Appreciate that. That's great. No, I like that. That's good. Uh, let, let's see what we've learned. Nothing about Wheaties, all right? Mutual submission means that we set aside our selfish desires, and work together for the goal of Christ's kingdom. Submission is putting our own life aside to seek the best for another person. The basis of Christian marriage is a spiritual unity that reflects Christ's relationship with his church. Christ desires that we have an intimate, eternal relationship with him characterized by love and submission. I want you to take a minute now and just think about what you've heard. And uh, whether you're married or not married, just think about what this means and how it's going to affect your life this week as you go forward. Yeah, seek that intimate relationship with God and continue to, to grow in that. Thank you, Betty. Yeah, thinking of submission not as giving up of power, but a way of giving love to the other person. Right. No, I like that. That's good. Okay, let's pray together. Father, thank you for your wonderful love for us, that you gave up uh, your position in heaven and came down uh, to show your love for us by living among us and then dying on the cross so that we can have that intimate relationship with you that's going to last forever. We pray that your word will live in our hearts, that you'll strengthen us and encourage us to truly become the people that you've called us to be, submitting to one another in love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.